welcome to the Getting Tight with Farmers part of the Grassroots series. My name is Brooke Sawyer. I'm the expert in residence at Cicada Innovations and particularly Cicada Grow Lab. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about how best to sort of get to know farmers and how best to, I guess, describe the agricultural landscape to help you with your ag tech journey. So at the moment, Australian agriculture represents around 58% of the land use, 11% of exported goods and services. Um, this is based on 2018-2019 ABARE statistics and represents about 2.2% of the value added GDP. 70% of all output of Australia is actually exported and 86% of that is traditionally to Asian markets. We employ about 2.6% of the population employment in various industries throughout agricultural sector. And historically, we have a really strong productivity growth. As you can see by the little infographic, um, livestock, I guess, represents around 47% of that GDP, while grains um, represents about 28%, 9 uh, from other industries and 17% from horticulture, fruit and vegetables and nuts and things like that. So a little bit about the farmer, I guess, um, just to help with a bit more contextual information before we get into the nuts and bolts on how best to get tight with the farmer. There's upwards of around 141,000 farm managers and owners around Australia in various forms. They are quite conservative by nature, majority of farmers. They're very traditional. A good proportion of farmers learnt how best to farm from their, from their forefathers and their foremothers. They utilise a trusted advisor and uh, trust forms a very large part of their business dealings as well. The average age of farmers in Australia is around 54, with only 13% of farmers under the age of 35. The average age of the workforce is 49 years old and with around 24% of them under the age of 35. So it is a bit of an aging population in terms of the workforce. It is quite a bit higher than all other collective industries completely. Um, and it is probably important to note that the bulk of farmers or farm managers generally are the owners of the land as well. So which is quite important in terms of engagement. So a little bit more about the farmer. So by and large, and this isn't the be all and end all, but by and large, a majority of farmers have fairly low digital literacy. So when we talk about digital literacy, we talk about their ability to probably understand the ins and outs of more um, ag tech type concepts. So um, if you talk a lot in acronyms about APIs and ecosystems and IoT and things like that, you're likely to get a few blank looks on your faces. So you need to be really clear when you're talking to farmers about these sorts of things. Their digital literacy obviously incorporates a whole lot more than just, you know, acronyms and terms. But, you know, a majority of farmers are very comfortable using smartphones, using iPads, even using computers to a certain degree as well with the transference of data, particularly um, yield data, looking at satellite imagery and understanding even basic concepts, you know, with Google, you know, with Google Earth. I guess a majority of farmers' intelligence seems to lie in other areas other than the digital sort of space. Their appetite to invest is quite moderate and gaining momentum more and more all the time. And this has really stemmed from their, this um, necessity to try and grow more or need to do more with less resources or more um, non-renewable type resources as well. They also have this increased need to manage resources, particularly the soil and environmental resources as efficiently as they possibly can. And whilst that isn't a new thing, I think the need to actually show that they are doing those things has been starting to become a lot more prominent. Um, you know, very recently as well, we've just sort of discovered this really big presence around consumer awareness about, and, and consumers making a lot more demands about requiring knowledge or, um, information about where their food, particularly food, is coming from. So and this is really sort of starting to drive a little bit more interest in technology, particularly around how do we capture that information and transfer that throughout the digital supply chain. 
Um, so whilst I mentioned before that traditionally, I guess, you know, there's always been this high growth in, you know, high for, for agriculture, at least steady and moderate growth in productivity on from a year on year on basis. But this is really starting to slow down a little bit and starting to plateau. We're not seeing these really great changes in just traditional um, farming systems like we were from about 20 years ago with the introduction of various different farming practices. We saw big leaps and gains in productivity. Um, now this is really starting to plateau. And I think that there's this more of this appetite from a farmer to actually look towards technology to see how that might actually give them a really big boost in the productivity, particularly when every time we turn around in the media, we're talking about this potential $61 billion increase in productivity. And I guess farmers are very much interested in, in understanding how the use of technology or ag tech can actually help, help them get a piece of that pie. So having said all of that, their capacity to invest is a little bit limited, I guess, even whilst, you know, we're getting this slowing of um, GDP increases or productivity increases are sort of steadily slowing up. There isn't this sense of urgency within farmers to actually change what they do and shake things up because they are still making money in a, you know, within a period of time, maybe not on a season by season basis, but on a five year cycle, they're making good money or reasonable money and can sustain a lifestyle that they like and are still able to reinvest in their farm. So whilst ever their back is not to the wall and they are actually still um, a profitable business, there's no real urgency to try and shake things up a little bit, particularly when there's a lot of unknowns. And whilst the appetite of, for investment is there, the need or necessity isn't. So that's really something to keep in the back of your mind. I'm not saying don't go into the ag tech space because, like I said, people are really starting to watch this, but it's something to be aware of, particularly when thinking about engaging with farmers. And farmers are like any other investor. Where the opportunity is greater to invest than it isn't, they are going to, you're going to see sort of momentum quite change. And it might seem um, the adoption curves, there's various different models around about adoption curves, particularly in agriculture. But, you know, it's always quite slow and steady. And then, you know, word of mouth gets around. And then we sort of seem to see these really, it becomes an exponential um, adoption curve and we see great numbers changing their ways and things like that. So I don't doubt for a minute that in the future, you know, the use of technology will become normal. And, you know, once upon a time, farmers used to introduce themselves as I'm a no-till farmer. Now they don't even introduce themselves as a no-till farmer because everybody's a no-till farmer. And, uh, and I don't think they'll ever introduce, hi, I'm a tech farmer, but, you know, it will be something that defines who they are and their business into the future. So some of the challenges that a farmer's face is, and these are things that you really need to think about, particularly when you're developing your product as well, that a majority of farmers still have very limited reliable internet connections as well. We're still mostly running off the 4G network if we can get it. A good proportion of farmers are still, you know, succumb to 3G, which is really not data reliable. Um, you know, this readiness to change as well, um, particularly adopt ag tech is, is slowly changing, but by and large looking inwards, a lot of farmers really don't sort of feel like they're fully ready because they don't understand where the opportunities lie. We have obviously some climate change and then not only that, but farmers are completely and utterly at the mercy of, of seasonal changes as well. We often have a good year followed by a number of drought years as well. And in those good years, they try to be a little conservative um, they will tend to make more investments, but it's usually on the things that have to be invested in as opposed to not so much things that's more of this nice to have rather than need to have. So that is something to be wary of too, that if you're kind of going in on a, on a third year of drought, then people's, um, I guess, ability or capability to actually invest in new technologies is going to be quite diminished. So whilst ever... Um, you know, ag productivity is continuing to gain momentum or, or increase without the need of ag tech, they are, farmers by and large, are starting to understand that technology has a really important role in unlocking this, this potential opportunity to be more, um, grow more and be more sustainable into the future and potentially ride out the highs and lows of seasonal dependency as well. So, 
Keep in mind that farmers are geographically incredibly isolated, which is going to be more of a challenge for you than for the average farmer. We all kind of live with it on a daily basis and we know, but you know, they, especially if you go into northern parts of Australia, farms can be hundreds and hundreds of kilometres, you know, from one span to the other. And that is, you know, that can sometimes be a challenge, but it also can be an opportunity for the use of technology as well. So we also have, you know, particularly on the back of COVID, we sort of suddenly now have quite a lot of uncertainty around future markets as well. So this is a big challenge for our farmers at the moment. And whilst ever there's that uncertainty around who's going to buy their produce and how and what the requirements to enter those markets are going to look like, there's always going to be a little bit of um, nervousness in terms of investing in technology as well. And not only that, but we have a really severe shortage of skilled labour. So I don't know if you, if you would have been watching um, plenty of news items in the last sort of three to six months have been talking about how, you know, you know hundreds of thousands of tonnes of fruit will end up on the ground because there's so few backpackers here because of COVID to actually come and pick them. But I'm not just talking about transient population that agriculture does rely very, very heavily on but also, you know, on more permanent staff that work within farms as well. Um, you know, their digital readiness or their, their skills, particularly in the digital side of things, is quite limited as well. So it's one thing to be able to engage with the farmer and get them to adopt technology, but it's not just them that needs to understand how these things work. There needs to be almost a transference of skills and knowledge from within the farm to actually make technology work within a farm surrounding as well. So these are some of the challenges that a lot of farmers look at when, you know, or, or in the back of their mind when they're looking at technology. So now that I've given you a really not so positive synopsis of, of, of farmers, which, which by and large, they're amazing people when dealing with a very complex um, growing system and there's a lot of challenges around that but so now I want to talk to you a little bit about how is the best way to communicate with farmers. First and foremost um, they are going to be skeptical of you straight off the bat. They're going to probably question one whether or not they even need the technology and two whether or not you know it's actually even worthwhile and does what it says it's going to do. So all I can recommend to you is to be as honest as you possibly can. It's okay to say that you don't know everything and it's okay to say that your product is not complete either. And it's okay to say to them, hey, this is where I think I'm at. I kind of feel like I've got a good idea, but I'd really love some feedback from you. Be confident, but don't be cocky and be really humble in your approach and be more than anything. And we'll talk... Um, talk to Duncan Abbey a little bit later on and he really sings to this tune be you really have to be empathetic with the farmer you have to really um, understand where they're coming from where the challenges are where the price points are and I guess where that low-hanging fruit is within any kind of farming system it doesn't make any difference what kind of farmer you are there are challenges everywhere aside from the logistical challenges there's challenges within the farm that you know where technology has a really vital role to play to increase efficiency, increased productivity, how much we grow, the way in which we do it, which overall increases profitability. So really trying to understand what those pain points are helps you to build empathy with the farmer and ensure that you're actually building a piece of technology that is not just tech for tech's sake and is and all becomes falls into this category of my hugest pet hate, which is uh, building a piece of technology and then racing around trying to find a problem for it to solve. You know, that's the worst possible way that you can try and build an ag tech company. Understand that market is so important and communicating with farmers in one way or another is the best way to build um, that really solid foundation of knowledge that you are nailing that product and you have a solution to an existing problem in mind. So when you're talking to farmers, be keen to listen and learn because you can learn a huge amount from them if you take the a, a casual and open approach to your conversation. And for goodness sakes, leave your sales pitch or your pitch deck that you have prepared for a VC, leave it at the front door with your boots and your hat. So farmers hate nothing more than being spoken to like they're in the boardroom, you know, casual, open conversation, be really honest about where you're at and 
and, and be prepared for a little bit of, you know, some really good feedback, quite a bit of honesty back. And if you're met with a little bit of antagonism, say if you're talking to your farmer about your product and they say, well, that's not going to work on my farm because of X, Y, and Z. If you're going, kind of getting that sort of feedback from the conversation, it'll be one of two things. One, you need to ask yourself, do I actually have it right? Have I nailed this problem? Do I really understand what the problem is, where the challenges are and where the pinpoint or the pain points are? Or two, am I not communicating it very well? So you need to sort of take a bit of an inward look. And I find so many, um, so many ag tech companies that I work with um, get a little bit of feedback and become really defensive as well. It's like, well, I did that because of X, Y, and Z. And sort of go, well, actually, you're sort of not listening and you're not kind of getting this feedback on where people are either one, confused, or two, don't see the value. So when you're being met with antagonism, then, you know, look inwards and, and you might find that there could be a bit more due diligence being done. Sorry to be really brutally honest about that one. Okay, so I think I mentioned to you earlier as well that the agronomist is, or a consultant, um, is somebody that a, a, a good farmer relies on all the time, or all farmers, I should say, not good farmers, but the, the advisor or the agronomist or the consultant, be it private, be it sales-based, um, they are probably the most trusted advisor on a farm and to a, and to a farmer. And not only that, but they also have this amazing multiplier effect. So every farm, every agronomist probably has upwards of five to 10, maybe even 15 farmers. So if you can kind of get in with an agronomist, you're actually sort of accessing a relatively large sort of group of farmers straight off the bat with one connection. If you have a product that is um, trying to duplicate, eliminate, or completely eradicate the, the future agronomist, I wouldn't recommend touching base with these guys. And, and not only that, but agronomists will probably look at this with a little bit of distaste and a little, not, not so much distaste, but a little bit of distru distrust as well, wondering whether or not, you know, because like everything, they are considering how do I, or where is my place in this future agricultural technologically advanced space? And particularly because we've seen a lot of technology come out that is trying to <clears throat> not completely eliminate, but slightly disrupt the role of the agronomist. But what I want to really drive home here is that because the agronomist is the most trusted advisor to the grower, they're probably not going to be going anywhere soon. So if you're trying to create technology that you think is a bit of a disruptor, actually start with something that actually, that probably becomes more of a, um, a tool for agronomists as well. So because I think a lot of farmers really don't make decisions, big decisions about this sort of stuff, particularly about the adoption of technology or the adoption of new practices without the consultation of their advisor or their agronomist. So choosing the right agronomist can be really, um, can be really valuable to you. If you get the right one, it can you know, open up so many doors for you. Private ones are probably more open in nature to working with founders and startups and ag tech companies. They're a little, little less constrained by corporate policy as well. They have less of an agenda and they're more focused on being able to offer something unique to their clients as well. And so much more willing to sort of step outside the square of their normal realm and actually do something where there's a beneficial relationship for both you and their client. But getting in touch with them is a little hard. Cold calling them, your engagement rate's going to be pretty low. I would imagine maybe only one or two may return your call after you've left them three messages. Um, if they're not returning your call, it's probably because they're not interested, but it could also be that they're just not busy. So by all means, call them twice if you're still not hearing from them. Try and email if you don't hear from them, then I would say they're not interested and just let it be. But there are other ways that you can um, stalk agronomists. I guess, you know, there's lots of haunts around that you can go to to find some, you know, find good opportunities to network with agronomists as well. So there's some amazing um, consultant networks around. For example, there's a cotton consultants network, which runs across the whole entire eastern seaboard of, of, where, of New South Wales um, and Victoria, sorry, Queensland and New South Wales. 
you know, there's lots of other, you know, young Aggies associations, for example. If you actually just have a bit of a Google um, around, there is a wealth of um, advisor type networks that you might be able to tap into and, and, and you know, get some engagement with them. So another really good way to get in with farmers is to try and offer some farm trials. They're incredibly time consuming. I will not deny that, but they can be really effective albeit they can you, you have to realize that particularly with farm trials you are a little bit sometimes at the mercy um, of the weather and they don't always go the way that you plan but if you're willing to put in a bit of time and effort they can be an incredibly great way to engage with farmers and the greater public as well so be prepared that you will be the one that does a lot of the giving um, but try and remember that the farm is actually kind of giving you back something as well, albeit not so much a financial thing, but they're giving you the opportunity to showcase yourself, not just to them, but potentially to the public as well. Because even if you don't have a field day, that farmer is likely to talk about it to his neighbours, his brothers, who are maybe also farmers and, you know, other people at the pub when he's having a beer and go, hey, I've got this trail on my farm, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, a farmer can be a really great advocate for you. So, you know, a farm trial is a really highly valuable way for you to establish a little bit of reputation and a little bit of a footprint for your product as well. Like I said, be prepared to give a fair bit. Don't ever ask for payment for your product, particularly if you are actually still developing it or validating it. Um, if you can afford to give something to a grower as a, you know, as a token or a gesture of your appreciation, they more often will not say, you know what, that's okay. But the offer to give something to them or to do something for them in return goes a huge way. Um, be prepared that you will need to do all of the work probably by yourself and be very careful about asking a farmer to literally go out of their way to help you unless there's a great benefit back to them. So that's something to be aware of as well. Like I said, great way to demonstrate. And sometimes it can be an opportunity for you both to showcase yourselves at a field day or via social media. Always ask the farmer's permission first if, if it's okay to mention him privately and it's something a good discussion you should have right at the beginning when you're talking about a farm trial how do you want to be acknowledged do you want to be do you not want to be do you remain anonymous have these conversations right at the get-go so another way to really get in with um you know a regional distribution network or create some regional distributions is through extension groups and or grower groups as well can be a great avenue for contacts so the, the Department of Primary Industry, for example, in pretty much every state um, within agriculture, obviously they have different focuses depending on their location within the state and, and what farming system that they lie in. But a majority of them all have extension staff. So extension staff are um, people that actively work between an, a, a researcher and the end user um, and, and transfer that knowledge, I guess, from an R&D perspective into into the into the farmer's hands so individual rdcs which are the research development corporations there's one that represents every um, industry in australia they often have a lot of information teams as well which actively go out and extend information from an r d perspective um, program managers are also a really great way or a great um, contact to have because they're obviously more often than not controlling at a more of a high strategic level where the investment is going. And if there's opportunity to collaborate with some of them, it could be a really great stepping stone forward, especially to get in front of a lot of farmer customers as well. Um, every ag vertical has an industry association or some sort of a council that represents them as well. <clears throat> So if you're really kind of looking for some key contacts and you can't get in by a, um, you know, a mentor like myself or you just having no luck catching the agronomy, you know, getting an agronomist to engage with you, really don't know where to start in terms of contacting cold canvassing with a, with a grower, then, you know, some of these industry associations are quite, um, <clears throat> you know, quite helpful in being able to tell you probably where the industry is at, where the key challenges are the industry for, and more than anything, be able to put you in touch with some progressive type growers that might be able to help validate, may host a farm trial, might have a field day for you, or, or if nothing else, just have a conversation with you so you can get some really good feedback. 
Now, there's one other avenue that I would also suggest, and there are grower groups all over Australia. So traditionally, I guess, and this hasn't changed a great deal, but farmers learn best from other farmers. It's probably the preferred learning platform by all, all farmers, irrespective of what industry. So they kind of, you know, catch up and have a beer and a steak sandwich at a field day. They talk about a lot of things and, and not just what's going on in that field day as well. But, you know, it's a great, you know, farmers tend to learn from each other and they like to bounce ideas off each other and network and, and share and strategize and all those sorts of things. And there's still a huge grower group presence throughout all of Australia. And we sort of come full circle as well. And we're back to having a huge amount of grower groups. So, you know, if you just sort of Google different grower groups, you know, there's, there's um, you know, within South Australia and WA, for example, they have a whole alliance that connects all of those grower groups irrespective of their interest or um, their main focus, they're all connected and there's a whole dedicated website that, that lists all the grower groups within Western Australia, for example, and probably where their core focus is, where some of the projects that they're working on. Some of these grower groups actually get money from RDCs to do small applied technology trials on farms. So, you know, if nothing else, you might be able to get a foot in the door as well to collaborate on an existing project or maybe run an independent project with them. So, um, like I said, you know, there's the Grain Growers one, which is sort of um, a, a national group for, that connects all of, all of the grain growers. Um, you know, some smaller ones, there's a lot of small land care groups that are fo focused more predominantly on grazing situations um, and particularly in sustainability. Um, and then you sort of have, you know, these different alliances, which are conglomerations of groups throughout Australia. So an excellent resource of people um, and, and very motivated people too, because they're all very focused on using um, improved practices, be it technology or not, to actually incite productivity changes for, for their members. Nothing beats pounding the pavement, um, probably the least um, efficient way of getting, um, getting traction or getting making some contacts in the industry, but nothing more effective than getting out there in your own boots and just literally event after event after event until you're blue in the cheeks and you know your pitch back to front. So, you know, there's plenty of agricultural events around the, around the nation that some of them are dedicated towards showcasing innovation. Some of them are field days literally in the field. Um, the RDCs and, and the departments of primary industries and stuff are probably the best um, resource um, in terms of finding out where some of those field days are. Um, there's a huge presence, obviously, at machinery days like Hanty and Agquip over here in on this side, um, down and over in Western Australia, Primex, Tokel, Wimmera, um, you know, Beef Week up at Rockhampton, um, GRDC have a huge following for the East, North, South and West, again, grains industry focused, but every industry would have, um, you know, would be covered in some of these machinery days as well. So you could either join as a guest or just go as a guest and just try and network with people, call canvassing, or demonstrate at your own booth, partner with another company, um, just try and actually probably just get your product and yourselves in front of as many customers as you possibly can. So obviously social media, Twitter is probably the preferred platform by farmers. Um, social media is becoming a really um, good way in which um, farmers are engaging with each other, particularly across where there's a great geographical, you know, divide between them. So you find so many farmers that are actually kind of mates on Twitter, never actually ever met, but really sound a lot of information off each other. A lot of growers sort of posting things. Hey, guys, I'm thinking about doing this. Anyone had any feed, you know, anyone had any experience with this? Um, so, you know, social media is starting to become quite a well features, particularly with a slightly younger generation. Um, great way to discover information, share information and get feedback as well. Um, you know, so try and get, if you can, you know, get be featured in some podcasts. And there is a wealth of podcasts around different channels um, to follow, listen to, try and get yourself involved in them. Um, you know, there's quite a few different farm you know, online articles and platforms around that, that often feature tech companies, particularly up and coming ones. 
you know, or even just, you know, different programs like a VOCAG, for example, like these are being made for, there's a whole series of information being developed for ag tech founders. But not only that, but they're starting to build up a lot of content online that is, um, that's very much about engaging with, with farmers too and, and featuring different technology, um, you know, and there's quite a few dedicated websites as well. So, you know, really be staunch and in getting into the social media and you'd be surprised at how much traction you might get, particularly from farmers using that, uh, using that method as well. So researchers is another way. It doesn't always open doors immediately, but, you know, the wheels turn quite slowly in the investment world, particularly in R&D. So, you know, the standard ones, um, CSIRO, any of the research development corporation funded projects that may or may not always be with departments of agriculture or universities, but they'll often, like I mentioned earlier, invest into small grower groups as well to run small applied technology type projects. So, you know, um, there's, you know, there's some big opportunities. They don't always open doors immediately, but if you can sort of touch base, particularly with some scientists um, or some researchers that are working very similar areas to where your um, product fits, be it robotics, you know, be it that next valve for a, you know, a trough or, um, you know, a particular type of new fencing equipment or anything like that. There will be some, some sort of level of research being done somewhere in one of the RDC's universities or departments and try and get in touch with them, align yourself with them, because who knows when that next project funding may come up they might actually try and include you because, you know, they are starting to become a lot more open at collaborating with, with startups and, um, and young founders. So there's a couple of different ways. So in summary, the best advice that I can give you is, particularly talking with farmers, don't overpromise and underdeliver. If you say you're going to do something, then make sure that you can do it. And if you don't think that you can do it, be really honest and open about that from the beginning. You don't have to always justify it. Just don't promise something that you can't deliver. Be really, be, be really realistic. Be realistic in what you think you can deliver as well. And be realistic about, um, I guess, you know, their expectations of you and what you are able to give back. I cannot stress more than anything to be honest. Um, be really open and upfront and honest with a farmer. There's this old saying, you know, you can only, you only get one chance to make a good impression. And so, but don't feel like you need to be somebody that you're not to make a good impression at all. So, like I said, if you if you kind of lie to a farmer or if you kind of extend the truth and they kind of work it out a little bit later, your kind of reputation is gone and down the window. So when it comes to working with farmers, it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, look, you know what, that that's a really good question or that's a, you know, that's a really fair question to ask. And to be honest with you, I haven't actually thought about that. And I'm really glad that you brought it up. So can you help me to, you know, generate an answer? You know, you, know, you have no idea how much a farmer would appreciate being able to help, you know, and contribute to something rather than sort of go, oh yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And they sort of go, they'll be polite to your face, but you turn around and you're gone and they'll be like, yeah, I don't think that they've got a lot of integrity. I'm just gonna stay away from that one. So. You know, I, I cannot stress enough to be really humble, empathetic, realistic and honest with a farmer when you're talking with them. Network, network, network. You just have to try and get in front of as many people as you can. And it, it is once you get in front of one or two farmers or one or two agronomists, you know, that relationship or that um, that that oasis of relationships starts becoming exponential or exponentially growing for you as well. But you've just got to be patient and just keep working away at it. So be aware of the logistical challenges. And uh, we're about to listen to um, Duncan Abbey from Western Fence. And uh, he actually is um, stealing this quote from him. And he says, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I'll let him explain a little bit more about what he means by that. So Thanks from me and, uh, and, and please stay on and join us for Duncan Abbey from Western Fence who offers a wealth of information and some really great insights into um, engaging with farmers and how, and how they um, develop their product over time. Thanks again. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Duncan, for being with us. Can you tell me a little bit about Western Fence and um, what, what exactly is your product and how did it come about? 
yeah, Western Fence is an, an exclusion fencing system. Um, it's a uh, it's feature in, in the whole system is the, the poly droppers that we manufacture now here in parks. Uh, it came about, um, my father-in-law, Peter Weston, um, started the, the, uh, the system back in the 90s and, and, and through a need that he had out on his farm. So the, the Western farm out at Nimiji, um, we've got an extensive property out there. Um, and as they've cleared and developed that over the years, um, what they found is they created an oasis for all of the, the wildlife in the area to come and feast on the, on the fruits of their um, productivity improvements. So Peter uh, pretty quickly realised that electric fencing uh, had, had merit in the area, uh, but the key was to get the power around the, the, product, uh, the property reliable. So uh, he started with the uh, um, Intel timber, um, and that was quite effective in the 80s. And uh, he, he did have some problems with that product um, in that it, it wouldn't hold the power very well and it, it started to break down over time. So he then embarked on uh, using poly and got Vinidex to, to um, make the first poly droppers uh, in, in the early 90s. Uh, they made a square post uh, he used to buy it in truckloads and cut it, drill it and run it out on his farm. That really increased the, uh, the performance of the, the electricity uh, around the farm. Uh, Poly's a great insulator and it's also very um, tough. If you think about uh, poly pipe or, or your chemical drums that are all high density polyethylene, um, they really stand up over time uh, in, in all sorts of conditions. So. The square dropper was a great success. However, over time, um, that was superseded by the I-beam design we have today. Um, and that mainly came about because of insects climbing up inside the dropper and um, shorting out the fence. So, so I guess Western Fence has had the luxury of, of Peter's um, R&D um, across many years. And, and, and you know, that 360, um, feedback that he was able to get by trying things out on the farm. But essentially, uh, the Western fence we have today is, is a, it's an easy to erect and quite effective um, livestock uh, <clears throat> barrier. But once you put the electricity into it, it becomes a fantastic um, deterrent for all the, the wildlife. So Duncan, I um, when we were chatting before, you were telling me about how the Western Fencing Company has sort of is a, it's a really nice story about taking waste on farm and turning it into something quite useful. Can you elaborate a little bit on that now? Yeah, look, it, it's uh, in the more recent years um, we, we've done a fair bit of work on on the the makeup of of, of what really is going to stand up in the in the landscape. Um, as I mentioned, the HDPE um, is a fantastic um, polymer in that it will stand, withstand um, temperature and, and impact uh, fluctuations in temper, temperature, especially. So, you know, in cold environments and warm, uh, it, it, it will stand up. Um, and yeah, we, we, we worked with some of our plastic suppliers and, and came up with a, with a formula that we could use recycled plastics um, and, uh, and, you know, we're really pleased to find out that it was right on our doorstep, uh, quite a lot of this material, and, and that being the chemical drums that farmers use every day. So, so we've partnered with Drum, drum Muster now, and, uh, yeah, we're, we're now collecting those, those drums and um, <clears throat> processing them um, in-house um, and turning them into posts, which is, which is really exciting. That's uh, such a nice uh, circular economy story, particularly finding some technology that's highly useful to farmers. And, um, you know, I know my husband uh, works in the merchandise space and, uh, you know, finds it to be a really, really easy product to sell. You know, it, it provides a perfect purpose um, for what it does. And that's, um, you know, and, and every, every one of his clients is absolutely thrilled with the product. So, um, what a, you know, it's a fabulous sort of story of, of how it came about. Um, 
can you tell me a little bit about your journey in getting traction? You know, you're a bootstrap company um, with no investors and have done this all on your own and built it into become, become quite a sizable and profitable company. Can you tell me how you've sort of gained that success? How, where did you sort of start? Did you just pound the pavement, get to as many ag events as possible? Um, you know, how did you really sort of get a bit of traction going? Well, I guess it started from our own internal use. Um, you know, we used it uh, extensively out on the farm at Nimogy. So we were able to get that feedback, um, you know, pretty directly and, and, and on a large scale. Um, and just, I guess, the productivity gains and, and the environmental gains that were achieved out there, um, it didn't take long for the, for the wider agricultural community to hear about you know Peter Weston and, and and the success he was having in a in a in a challenging um, area for agriculture, you know. So the the, the livestock success, you know, at, at markets, the, the ground cover that he was able to achieve when other people um, weren't gaining um, the, the same sort of results, you know, led to a lot of interest from the agricultural community. So there were bus trips, you know, um, field days held out there. And, and just word of mouth that, you know, this, this fencing system was, you know, Peter held it um, as, a, as a quite a significant you know, contributor to his success. And, but, you know, it was much about controlling the livestock um, as, as it was about, you know, keeping out, um, you know, the feral pressure that was impacting on his ability to, to run the system. So um, I guess it started, yeah, by word of mouth and, and those um, field days and excursions that were held out there. Um, he, in, in the nineties, he, he entered some um, farm inventor competitions for, for, for the trailers and the, and the drilling machines and the um, clip making machines that, that um, make making the product possible and, and was successful in those at the orange field days, et cetera. So, it just started to gather, gather its own steam. Um, you know, we went along to a few field days as well, um, did some small local advertising, but, but largely it grew from, from word of mouth. Yeah, okay. So I know that there's still, you know, uh, the Western Fence is featured a lot in different uh, field days and things like that nowadays. So would it be fair to say that even 20 years on, you're still actively marketing your product to engage with different audiences? Oh, absolutely. It, it's it's not a product, I guess, that um, will sell itself or sell itself um, as quickly as you might need it. Uh, you really need to to get in front of farmers, and, and you know, we take every opportunity we can to to uh, engage with the end users uh, because you know it, it's it's when you face to face, you know, and, and they can actually see the fence. Um, it's another really important um, piece around our marketing efforts. We, we always like to build a fence and, um, and, and then you can really show the features and benefits and people can touch it and feel it and understand it. And, and uh, you know, it gives people a far better understanding of um, what it's all about and how it can help them. So yeah, it's, it's critical that we get out and about and the more, the more we're out and about, the more we learn. Yeah, for sure. I to totally agree. Um, Duncan, a little while ago, we were talking about um, building empathy with farmers. Can you, can you give me a bit of a rundown on your sort of experience and, and how important that is to, to the success of your business? Oh, I think it's critical. Um, you know, the, the old saying, you know, people don't care what you know until they know you care. It's... You, know, you, you need to understand um, you know what's going on out in the in the field for want of a better word you, you, you need to understand what the, the pinch points and the, the issues that people are having on farm and and where your product can can help with that regard and and uh, you know I guess it's you know people are more likely to, to spend money on something that's going to uh, have a quick return on investment. Um, or, or help uh, fix a, a pinch point or, or a need on the farm. So yeah, definitely, uh, I think empathy 
uh, understanding and, and be humble. You know, we're, 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 we're lucky in that we're farmers as well. We, we do understand and, and uh, you know, I think it's, it's really important that you don't come across as arrogant um, or, or a, a know-all. Um, you, you just have to uh, be open, honest, and, and uh, proud of your product and, and, and also confident in, in what it can do. Yeah, no, there's some, some really valuable points there as well. Um, on that note, if, you know, like you said, you were quite fortunate that you were already well entrenched in the, in the agricultural business as a farmer yourselves. If you, if you weren't a farmer, do you think your approach would have been a little different? Yeah, it's a hard, that's a hard question. Um, yeah, it is hard. And when you are a farmer, it makes it easier yeah, to get, yeah, get a bit of traction. Uh, so um, I guess I'm looking for a couple of, you know, a couple of little other tips, you know, for mm. the, the non-ag background founders out there, which yeah. there's plenty of. And, and like I said to you before, you know, I think it's an amazing thing that we're attracting new skills and new talents to agriculture that can bring a, a completely different perspective. But, you know, if you do you know, is there some tips or tricks that you could offer those guys that may not necessarily have the ag contacts um, that might help them gain a bit of credibility and break that ice a little bit with, with engaging with farmers? So, sorry, I nearly fell off. Yeah, look, I, I'd, um, I'd rely on, on uh, industry, you know, experts, you know, such as yourself or the LLS. Um, you know, I guess my approach would be to, to find the, the early adopters um, the innovators uh, or the well-respected, you know, the Peter Westons of, of, of each region or, or area and, and really um, strike up rapport and a relationship with those um, stakeholders and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, get them to adopt your product and, and, um, and then take it from there. And, and really, you know, if, if, if you can get those key industry people to to be an advocate for your product i think it's a it's a fantastic start yeah yeah absolutely and uh i guess you know engaging some of those key innovators within certain areas is a, is another really valuable way of getting some traction as well isn't it so if you can get yeah. get one of one of those farmers who everybody watches and nobody plants before that yeah. particular person starts planting or you know takes a bit of a risk to plant when maybe the forecast isn't always looking so great you know those farmers can be incredible um, supporters of technology as well because naturally they do tend to want to try things that are a little different um, and, and look for opportunities I guess to create bit more efficiencies and, and greater profitability margins on their properties so if you can engage with those guys they can be a world of advertisement for you as well would you agree with that? Oh for sure and, and yeah you need to start somewhere in terms of you know getting runs on the board with your product you, you need to have it in the field uh, you need to have you know people using it and and that might cost you money you know, to start with um, okay. you know if I'm thinking about a, a new venture um, to get it out there initially you know you, you may have to contribute some money to to um, you know get it on farm and, and, and to get the I guess the, the traction um, you know it, it is being used and it is working in the field. Um, you know, it's it's critical for people to, to be able to, you know, see it, um, understand it, but then to, to hear of other people having success with it. Yeah, yeah, good eye. Um, you know, from my understanding, you know, Western Fence has an incredible reputation, particularly, um, you know, I sort of see Western Fence as one of those companies that has an amazing rapport with farmers uh, very much backs their product, um, you know, and ensures that it's of the greatest, greatest of quality. Can you, can you tell me how hard it was really to establish a, that sort of a reputation? You know, is it something that takes time? Are, are there things or some tips or tricks that you can give to a budding founder that can help build a reputation? And, and, and I guess, you know, how important is that reputation and what do you feel your reputation is? Look, it's, uh, you mentioned there time, it, it takes time. And I guess that's our biggest um, learning. Um, you know, Western Defence was registered in the year 2000. So, you know, we're, we're certainly not 
uh, a new business, uh, or, or be it it wasn't our core business for, for the first 15 years of, of, of that time. But I, I guess the, the keys for us in gaining a reputation is um, you know, ensure the product um, has got integrity and the quality of it is, is, is critical. Um, you know, we, we inspect every length that comes out of the machine and we, we, we don't ship, you know, substandard uh, materials. Uh, be available to your customer. Um, you know, if the people ha have issues with installation or once it's up and running, they, they have um, uh, operational issues, you, you need to be there and stand, stand behind your product. And, and if there are um, faults or failings or issues with your product, you, you got to back it. You got to stand behind it and and um, and, and fix the, any issues. And um, touch wood, uh, they that has been a minimal um, uh, situation with our product. Um, there, there were some challenges in the early years, but uh, you know we've we worked pretty hard on our on the quality of our raw material. Um, so so you know we stand 100% behind our um, the quality and integrity of the product, but. But I guess, yeah, just you got to be patient, and uh, and you got to be willing to to get on the end of the phone and, and um, support your product. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand totally on that one. I know that um, there's a little bit of a you know a very small but uh, wary population out there, I guess, that have often come across products that. Uh, that sound really good on paper, but don't always deliver what they say that they're going to deliver. And and I mean, whether you're in the startup or the ag tech world or you're in retail, there's we see so many of those products around that don't always give us the results that we expect. And, and then we end up feeling a little disgruntled and, and what have you. So um, no, I totally understand that. And I think it's really important yeah. to, um, to keep, uh, you know, keep on top of that and ensure that your reputation is built the way it's supposed to be built in and, and you maintain that yeah. over time. And, and so. I guess now we've, we've got the luxury of having over 20,000 kilometres of the product out there. So uh, that's, that's a fair um, track record in terms of, um, you know, credibility and, and the fact that, you know, installed correctly, our, our product does deliver. And, and you do get a, a very quick return on investment. So, yeah. um, you know, it's something that, that's taken time, but, uh, you know, it, it's, we're now reaping those rewards. Mm, fabulous. Thank you so much, Duncan, um, for your time on this. It's been really valuable and um, I appreciate uh, your time on that. No worries. Glad I could help. <laughs>